Aw, oh, look at the new little critter. Mm. <laughs> who put salt in my water? Clay Entertainment, that's who. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the launch preview, not to be confused with early access. This is the test branch build of the game that will become Oxygen Not Included, the official release here in July. So let's get started unpacking this thing because there's a lot of stuff to go through. Now, a lot of the big things they've listed here in the patch notes, however, there's a lot of little things that they didn't necessarily list, so I'll try to reveal a few of those as well. Let's start with the main thing, the three new biomes that are going to be mixed into all of the different maps that we can play on. So the first one is forest. So forest kind of replaces our starting biome right here. And you can see that it contains a lot of things like dirt, uh, aluminum ore, and other things such as trees. So different plants, different critters, it's a whole new biome. And the other thing you might notice here is that the starting biome is not quite as uniform as it used to be. In many of the maps I play, it kind of has a different unique shape and it kind of blends more seamlessly into other biomes around it. On this map, if we just move to the right here, we'll end up in the rust biome. So that contains a lot of rust and other things that are familiar to us, such as iron ore. However, there's other plants inside of here that also kind of make it a really unique biome. So that is biome number two, rust. If we keep moving to the right, we'll find ourselves in the last new biome here on this map, and this is tide pools. So this contains salt water, salt, and other new plants and critters that go along with this biome. Now, all of these new biomes get mixed into a new game when you go to start it up here. So you can see that there's many different asteroids right here, and you can kind of select the scenario you want to play. Not all of them contain all the same biomes. And as you kind of move to the right, the game is meant to become more difficult or a harder starting scenario. So as you can guess, this one right here doesn't have much water. This one is kind of hot. This one is a little bit salty. Chance of survival, slim. However, there's more to that as you can kind of remix the same sort of scenario down here with unique traits, such as maybe this map has a surface ocean. Below the crust of this asteroid is a saltwater sea. Hmm, interesting. If you'd like to try an easy map with all of the new biomes, Arborea is going to be the map for you. So let's explore this map here and see what, hmm, metal rich name and surface ocean is all about. And also has large boulders and small boulders. This will be a good example. There's a new quality of life thing here that they've added and that allows us to pick the positive traits of our duplicant so we can roll a digger and then we can just hit here and re-roll it over and over again. And they'll at least have digging every time. All right, so if we just take a look here at the world, we start in the forest on this map. And remember that it had large boulders, small boulders, was metal rich, and had a surface ocean. So if we take a look at the map from a larger view here, you can see that this area down here is what is considered a large boulder. That's a giant chunk of obsidian sitting in the middle of your map. Your duplicates are going to love digging that up. However, there's, there's other boulders in here that contain metals. This one here has iron ore. Ooh, this one has diamond and some iron ore inside of it. How about that? Mmm, gold amalgam, baby. Yeah. Now I thought this one was going to have a large surface ocean. However, it doesn't really have like, well, it isn't a giant tide pool. There is a lot of water up though at the top. So maybe that's what they meant. However, it's a good time to mention that I think with all of those variables, there's going to be a lot of tweaks between now and the launch of the game, especially with all of the playtesting that's going on. Let's take a look at all the other asteroid variants. Let's take a look at Terra. Apparently it's a target location with a balanced variety of resources. Basically, should be the easy map, as easy as this game gets. <laughs> okay, so in the Terra map, you can see that we start off with kind of the normal, I don't know what we want to call it, biome that we're used to right there, with a lot of copper ore, some water, plants, and whatnot. However, we will notice here that it doesn't have that same shape that, it, it, that we're used to, where it's kind of more circular. To get the lay of the land, having the temperature overview is a good way to kind of look at it right there. But you can see that mostly in this map right here, everything is kind of moderately temperature, you know, and then it has areas of cold that are surrounded by a fair bit of abyssalite. I've noticed that the boundary between biomes is a little bit more fuzzy than it used to be. Now this map here was described that it had kind of a surface ocean, so we can see there's a lot of tide pool up here, and in general there's just a lot of all the kind of normal biomes that we've been used to from way back. What's interesting is how these biomes are kind of either mixed together or separated depending on how much abyssalite is present. And that is an interesting interplay with a lot of these different asteroids as we take a look at them. This one down here has the typical oil biome right down here at the bottom and magma really doesn't play into it that much. Unless of course you go to uncover it and 
you know, potentially melt your base. So while Tarot might be the closest thing we've had to the default map that we've been used to, let's take a look at the Verdante map a lush target location with rich wildlife and self-sustaining resources. Okay, we can see here that the Verdante map starts us off in the new forest biome. And as we kind of scroll out and look at the rest of what's going on right here, you can see that there's a lot of tide pool sort of thing. So a lot of salt water that we're dealing with right here. And that also brings into play a lot of rust as well. The temperatures overall are fairly reasonable. Like I wouldn't, uh, you're not really going to suffer temperature wise. You'll definitely get a lot of exposure to all of the new biomes in this map as well. A whole lot of slime. Uh, not a lot of kind of igneous rock in though. Kind of, well, I mean, there it is. There's a little bit of that right there. Overall, this map looks like it has a good mix of all the different biomes that are in the game, uh, just with the different starting biome. Oil, still down here at the bottom, just like we'd expect it, and magma really isn't playing a role. This map in particular has a huge amount of water near the surface of the asteroid. Look at that. So just to keep things consistent, let's go ahead and take another look here at the Arborea map. So with this map, once again, we're starting off in the forest. And as we kind of scroll out a little bit further, we have a lot more rust biomes as well. Matter of fact, the biomes on this map look to be a little bit smaller and there's a fair bit more cold zones. What I notice is that there's a very, very limited amount of biomes like this one right over here that has iron ore, igneous rock, phosphorite, whatever you call that, the chlorine biome. So while it's easy to see what's in the map, the thing you want to look for sometimes is what's not in the map. And in this case, the slime biome. I don't see it at all. I think if they had the biomes and potentially the ratio listed right down here, that would help us make a more informed decision than, rather than just the description. Those are kind of the basic maps, but now we get into some cool variants, such as the Badlands. This is a barren target location with an overabundance of mineral resources. We've moved from likely or probable down to moderate. The Badlands starts us off in kind of the traditional biome down here, but as we can see once we reveal the rest of this, what is going on? Ooh, this looks like a cool map, doesn't it? So while there's water near the top on this map, there's some areas where there's some cold biomes over here, mm, and I see no slime whatsoever. No forest either. This indeed is a hard map. And look at this. Loads and loads of igneous rock and granite. Oh my gosh. Your dupes will dig till their hearts content around here. Look at this. Oh my gosh. Iron, obsidian. On this map, we can see that magma is still not really playing a role to heat up a whole lot of your map. However, we can see that they're starting to play with how it's shaped and everything. This is, this is a cool map. Here's the other thing to kind of notice the boundaries between these biomes isn't necessarily surrounded by abyssalite. Take a look at this one right here. This is a really, really cold biome right next to your starting biome, but there's no abyssalite to keep that cool from coming in here and killing off some plants. So the boundary conditions are different. I like it. So that was the Badlands. Now let's take a look at Rhyme here, where the challenge increases yet again by decreasing the temperature. So the rhyme map, you know, honestly, doesn't look that hard. It's just kind of like a normal game, right? You know, you scroll out, you see, okay, we got some rust, we got some different biomes, they're nicely mixed, decent boundary conditions, until you hit the temperature overlay. Ooh, that's gonna be fun. Starts out at a chilly 13 degrees Celsius and progressively gets colder, minus 33, ooh minus 40 and something, oh my goodness. So yeah, you can understand how this map is going to be challenging because it's a battle against the cold. However, it is a pretty cool map in that you do have access to all of these different, different biomes right here. So this one gives you the normal biome, but right up here, look at this, the forest biome is right there. That's pretty cool. And tide pool, like this map has a little bit of everything. The only catch is that it's really cold. Can I have that map at 20 degrees Celsius, please? Thank you. A radio flips the script from being cold to being nice and hot. This one starts us off in the nice forest biome, but then as we scroll out, we can see the rest of it. You see that we still do have pretty much all of the different biomes, maybe not the default stand zone one that we're used to, but hmm, yeah, this one looks fairly reasonable. However, the biomes do look really, really small on this map. They're very mixed and lots of little pockets. However, the big question here is, what's the temperature look like? It's kind of it's kind of warm. So this map starts off at about 30 degrees Celsius and increases from there to 45 or 50. 
with some areas being even warmer up there at 80 degrees Celsius. Woo. In my personal opinion, this one doesn't look quite as hard as I, as I would expect. So it's definitely hot, but it isn't quite unbearable. You'll need to flush a lot of heat away, which kind of sounds like a really fun map to play. So chance of survival is marginal, but now we get into the really creative maps. So this brings us to the next map here, which is the Oasis. And in my personal opinion, I think this might be the hardest map of them all. It's described as a desolate target location with a cache of life-sustaining water trapped beneath the surface. However, I would describe it as a digging death trap. Look at this. So you have a forest biome that you start off with, and then you're surrounded by a massive amount of sand. Like a massive amount. Look at... Would you look at this? Look at all of this sand. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Your duplicates don't stand a chance. They're going to bury themselves alive over and over again. Now this map looks really cool in that you start off in the forest and it's surrounded by a lot of sand, which might as well just be considered a sand biome. Is that another biome? Clay, did you sneak a fourth one in? Maybe? Kind of looks like it. This looks like a cool map though, in that we have some tide pools over there, we also got some slime biomes. Uh, the one thing that you don't have is an oil biome down here at all, and there's just none of it. So... Hmm... So that makes things kind of interesting, now doesn't it? I like it. This is a neat map, but not an easy one. This brings us to Volsina, which is, in my opinion, aesthetically the coolest map that they've created in this game. A target location rife with molten lava pockets and intense heat. Chance of survival? Slim. Of course, if many of you are thinking, wow, my chance of survival is already quite slim, then you may not want to try this map. Because while it may look normal at first glance, it is anything but that once you take a larger look at the map. Ooh, you have areas of obsidian with magma inside of it. How cool is that? That looks pretty neat. Now here's the thing. Depending on how the map generates, not all of that magma is always going to be trapped behind abyssalite. So, things can get a little toasty. Matter of fact, we had a previous version of the game where the magma was not trapped behind abyssalite. And yeah, it got really, really toasty. <laughs> so yeah, you can see how this map plays out. That is neat. That is super cool. And look at this. Look at how much space there is up here at the, at the top. Oh, they're playing around with how much space there is. Oh, that's cool. So not only can you dig up here, but you have to be careful of where you go, otherwise you might accidentally vent your base into space. Hmm. Let's take a look at the temperature overlay because it's it's not all cool. Matter of fact, it's quite hot. It's a lot of hot. <laughs> look at this. So we got magma right here next to a large boulder. Oh, have fun digging that thing up. Life is not guaranteed. Good luck, duplicants. You'll need it. This brings us to the last asteroid variant. I know there's been a lot of them. This is Oceana. So this brings us to the last asteroid variant right down here, Oceana. A target location with vast quantities of a drinkable salt water. Okay, so this map here starts you off in kind of the traditional biome right there, but as we scroll on out and we see the bigger things, you can see that we are surrounded by a lot, a lot of salt water right there. Tons of salt, all of that stuff right there. So what we don't see on this map uh, which might make it difficult. I was trying to find, okay, what's the thing that makes this difficult? And what I don't see, do I not see rust? So you might have salt, but you don't have rust. Is that what I'm getting at? And yeah, that looks to be the thing that might make this real di really difficult because you're going to have to, you know, use salt water, which means you have to desalinate it, but you don't have rust. So that kind of inhibits kind of the new equipment and how you generate oxygen. I don't know, I don't know. To me, it doesn't quite look as hard as they would claim it to be, but I don't know. You have to play it to find out. So as you can see, there are many different map scenarios to play, and I think that adds a ton to the replay value of Oxygen Not Included. This is echoed by one of the new things down here, which is Colony Summaries. So with this tab here, we can see all of the different colonies we've had in the past down here. So in the testing terror right here, you can kind of see all of the different buildings I built inside of here, then my duplicates, and over here will be a time lapse of the actual game as you're playing through it. Right now, it doesn't really do anything just yet, but I'm thinking they're working on it, and it might be kind of cool at the, at the end, especially if we can export and kind of upload that. That would be pretty neat. Over here on the right is the different achievements, and these also serve as goals to kind of achieve as you're playing through the game. 
You've got your major ones right here. So there's kind of a mid game win, which is to colonize the asteroid. And then there is the very late game win, which is to escape the asteroid. And then there's a lot of milestone goals down here that kind of give you an idea of what all of you have achieved inside of that map. So if we take a look at one of my current playthroughs brought into this new test mode, uh, the super dupe mega base right down here, you can see how many buildings I've built. I have more ladders than anything else. Although a close second here is insulated liquid pipes and tiles. However, I, I haven't built a lot of drywall. That's just kind of in the game already. So there's that, I guess. So one of the minor things I've achieved here is and nowhere to go. I have eight duplicates that are wearing the non-default clothing. They're all actually in snazzy suits. So when you take a look at the graphs, these should look somewhat familiar as I've actually crafted my progress in this game using mods. You can see things such as the average oxygen output, uh, the average power produced and whatnot, how that's actually gone up over time, the work time. However, this doesn't seem to be balanced per duplicate, so it's not like an average thing. So travel time is still, is still kind of weird. Like I said, it's interesting, but it isn't particularly useful. As mentioned in their patch notes, there's some stuff for mods that might allow them to make even better mods here in the future. So we'll just kind of have to see how that all progresses. So far, people have done some really awesome stuff. Okay, so here we are in a test map. Let's take a look at some of this new equipment that they've added to the game. One of the machines down here is the rust deoxidizer. So this is a new way to produce oxygen. It uses salt and rust in order to create oxygen and chlorine. So it runs at a fairly efficient 60 watts right there and produces 570 grams of oxygen and 30 grams of chlorine. That's a neat piece of equipment and it's very similar to the electrolyzer. So we may have to filter that gas in some creative ways. Speaking of salt, one of the other machines that we have down here is a desalinator. So what this does is that it, it takes in salt water and it will actually output clean water. So it's a lot like a water sieve or a carbon skimmer, but for salt water. And this works with either brine or salt water. So that's actually two different liquids that are now in the game. If you take a look at the different properties here, what we have with salt water is that it is 98% water, 2% salt. However, brine is 80% water with 20% salt. The two ways that I know of, of how to actually separate the water from salt is either using a desalinator machine or heating it up to the point where it actually boils off. And they have different temperatures that they will boil at too. These have different properties. You can see the thermal conductivity of brine is 0.6, specific heat is 3.4, specific heat of salt water is 4.1 with thermal conductivity of 0.6. So a little bit different right there and they boil at different temperatures, but it's all pretty close to water or polluted water. Now, what happens if we drop salt into water? Does it become salt water? Well, so far it doesn't look like it will dissolve in water uh, as we might expect in the real world. So in game, if your dupes were to accidentally drop salt into water, I think the two will stay separate. So if you wanted to make salt water for some reason, I don't necessarily know how you would actually do that right now. And as expected, there's also going to be a new geyser for salt water. Getting back to the desalinator over here, you can see that this equipment uh, moves water at about five kilograms or 4.6, and then the rest of that is kicked out as salt. And that operates at 480 watts. So. It's fairly reasonable. Since we're on the topic of salt, salt plays a major role in many different things. We saw it already in how it pertains to water, but the Dasha salt vine right over here actually consumes chlorine, which is why I have it under the deoxidizer right down here, and it turns it into salt. Now, salt can be crushed via the rock granulator into table salt, which then can be used at a mess table in order to improve the quality of food by one morale. So while table salt can be used to improve the quality of our food at the mess table, it also leads us into the gas range right down here, which has many new recipes for us to explore. It's a higher tier food category beyond the electric gas grill. Now the gas range has new ingredients for us to explore. It's a tier above the electric grill in that we can do things like mushrooms, wraps, sushi. You can also see barbecue is in here as well. So a lot of these are very high quality foods such as great, anywhere from plus three to plus five quality of food. Now the disadvantage of this machine is that it uses quite a bit of resources. It seems to consume quite a bit of natural gas and it outputs a fair bit of carbon dioxide. So with that in mind, one big change to the game is that barbecue is no longer available in the electric grill. So this brings me to the next piece of equipment right down here, the wood burner. It's a new way of generating power inside of our base. The wood burner produces a fair bit of carbon dioxide, generates 300 watts of power, 
and consumes lumber at 1.7 kilograms a second, which right now I don't think are going, is going to be the final numbers because it doesn't really seem to be that well balanced with its main competitor, the coal generator. So naturally the arbor tree right here grows over 18 cycles right now. So you can see that this thing here is just been planted and is now ready to be harvested. However, if you were to plant it into a farm tile right there, uh, it requires phosphorite and polluted water, 35 kilograms per cycle. And then the life cycle is 4.5 right there. So while I'm waiting for these trees and the branches to actually grow off of them in order to harvest, uh, let me go ahead and spawn in just a little bit of lumber just to kind of see, show you how this thing runs. There's a, a couple of pieces of equipment that actually use lumber. Not only the wood burner, but right down here, the ethanol distiller. So the ethanol distiller consumes lumber and it outputs a new liquid that we have available to us, ethanol. Now I think ethanol liquid is going to be quite useful because it's a highly flammable liquid. So I was actually able to power a petroleum generator using ethanol as opposed to petroleum, which makes the petroleum generator more viable on some of those maps where we don't necessarily have that oil biome available to us, or it might be very, very small. So it's a different way to reuse the same piece of equipment and it may even be available to you uh, a little bit earlier in the game. And that thing can generate 2000 watts. So that's pretty cool. Now I did try to use it as a fuel for the rocket, but it didn't work. So, so far the only thing I know that it can actually run is the petroleum generator. So while ethanol liquid will be useful in its liquid form as a power source, not only that, it will be useful in its gas form at 78 degrees Celsius because its thermal conductivity properties are fantastic. Thermal conductivity of one with a specific heat capacity of 2.1. That allows us to actually move a lot of heat from one spot to the next in a gas form right there. Not only that, if it goes from a liquid and then to a gas, it's going to be kind of interesting. We can do a lot of fun stuff with that. It's far and above better than hydrogen or phosphorus. So one of the new pieces of equipment in the game is the duplicate motion sensor. You can kind of see the range of that piece of equipment right there. So whenever a dupe is in that area, it will detect that they are there. So in this case, I'm using it to turn on and off lights as the duplicates move through that area. And you can also see inside of this ranch right here, I'm using that to control that light so that it only works when the duplicate is present. Matter of fact, many of the rooms now require that you have a light source within the room. Doesn't necessarily say that it has to be on though. So the stable is one example and the Great Hall is another one. That's why this lamp is here. Speaking of new rooms, there's a new one down here, uh, and this one is the Nature Reserve. That gives you a plus morale of six, which is actually fantastic. Uh, the smaller version of that is a park, which has a morale boost of three. So the thing I like about this is that for those of us that actually like to preserve our biomes and not necessarily just dig up the entire map, we now have a way to preserve that and get a bonus for it using a, the new piece of equipment the park sign. One other piece of equipment that's listed as new is this airborne critter lure. I'm not really sure what's all new about it, except for maybe the word airborne. Clay, what, what are you doing? Well, maybe they were just busy making a giant monument. Well, this monument is more than just a giant piece of decor. It's actually a main goal for your base. So if we go to the colony summary, building one of these really large monuments allows you to achieve the objective colonize asteroid. And it's one of these cool things in that you can go in here and kind of select different poses and whatnot and match them up with different things down below. So <laughs> you can kind of do all that stuff. There's no head art up there um, and there is this sort of debug uh, victory right down here. So, so it's a cool thing and I'm looking forward to all of the different poses. It is, however, worth noting that these things will not be easy to build. Look at the resources on this bad boy. 7,500 steel, 2,500 obsidian, We've got tons of ceramic, plastic, steel, glass, diamond. Yeah. So that's why it's one of the major milestones for your colony. Speaking of milestones for your colony, there's a new one located in the star map, but it is way, way, way out there. Good luck achieving this one. This is the temporal tear, and if you can get a duplicate to fly all the way there, that is the ultimate achievement on oxygen not included and there may or may not be something fancy that happens. You'll just have to play the game to find out. So the printing pod has been reworked a little bit. It still kind of prints duplicates and critters or whatever uh, as it used to. However, it now also serves as your jobs board. So the jobs board piece of equipment is no longer in the game. So when you go to your skills and you say that I want to skill up, let's say meep here from farming one to farming two or crop tending, 
then he'll head on over here and get enlightened with his new job and abilities. These poor dupes keep getting... <laughs> so there you go. Put on your new hat, Meep. All right, so let's take a look at this tree once it reaches 100%. These trees up here say it's growing branches. I've yet to see the branches grow. It's very slow. Oh, there we are. So this one is now growing branches. Interesting. So the plant is is different. It doesn't just grow. It grows branches and then you harvest the branches off of that. So 4.5 cycles to grow and then another 4.5 after that to grow the branches. And then does the whole thing start over again or do the branches just start over? I told you there's a lot to unpack here and it's all in the little details that aren't in the patch notes. Just saying, oh, there's a new tree doesn't really cover it because it's not like any of the other plants that we've dealt with before. Speaking of new plants, how about the oxygen fern down here? Super useful. It consumes carbon dioxide and emits oxygen. So yet another way to make oxygen in the game called Oxygen Not Included. However, in this situation, the domestic growth consumes dirt and water. Those are two precious resources. Water is fairly replenishable. Dirt, eh, there's other ways of making dirt now. So maybe, maybe not. But what we can see here is that the wildlife growth is 25% the throughput of domestic growth. So that is consistent on, well, on any plant where you can read it. Let's see if I could find a nosh sprout anywhere. This is a different plant. It grows beans, just like that. It likes to live in the temperatures of negative 25 to zero um, and lives in the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. The effects is the nosh bean which is an ingredient to something else. And the nosh bean is used in spicy tofu. However, it too consumes water and a little bit of phosphorus. This game should be called water not included. What other plants are there? Oh, one of the bigger changes here is to the wheezewort. In case you haven't noticed that one already, it, you can't put it in the flower pot anymore. Clay, they now made it require 20 kilograms of phosphorite per cycle in order to get 100% the throughput of it. So the Weezworts aren't so cool anymore. So rest in peace, my Venturi Weezworts. It was nice while it lasted. Oh, and you can't put them on doors anymore. Crap! Unless there's automation. Eh, but technically you can automate the delivery to it. Well, look at this care package, a wart seed. <laughs> All right, where is the other plant? I know you're around here. Aha! There it is, one other plant. The water weed. And the water weeds are nice. Why? Because you get lettuce out of them. 3,600 calories worth. They grow in water, they grow in salt water, and they grow in brine, so long as it's one tile tall. Otherwise, it's drowning. And drowning makes plants sad. They don't like that. And it doesn't look like it consumes the salt water. It just kind of floats around in it or whatever and does what it does. So yes, you can grow it in a farm tile just like this with salt water right above it. Domestic life cycle, 12. So that's actually going to be pretty useful. I like the water weed. So that weed right there looks pretty useful. I think we'll grow it in industrial quantities. Yo, tree, are you done growing yet? Grow! Okay, so one of the other things that's actually different here is that there is such thing as a paku filet down here. So to make sushi, you need that. And this is an uncooked fillet of a very dead Paku. Now the thing is when you go to attack a Paku, uh, it actually, currently in this build, well, it drops meat. I'm thinking that that should drop a Paku fillet. Or maybe if it dies of old age, I don't yet know how that's supposed to work. And I haven't found any piece of equipment that allows me to do anything different. However, that will be part of the game at some point. Somehow, I just haven't figured it out yet. Another spot where they've made a change to the game, and I really do like this one, is in research. So you can see here that you can kind of zoom in and zoom out, and everything's kind of categorized by food, by power, by solid material right there. This makes a lot of sense. I like this. So this way you can kind of see right where you're at. It doesn't necessarily give you a tier or anything like that. It just lets you categorize things. Exosuits, right? This is all exosuits. And some things branch out and connect to other stuff as well. According to a post on my Discord channel, drowning makes a critter unhappy. Hmm, it's glum. I don't know if it's necessarily unhappy. <laughs> Look at its animation, though. 
I like it. That's fun stuff. Okay, so this tree is about to grow its branches. Hey, there we go. Harvest is ready. Now we'll see just how much we actually get out of this tree. Ooh, there we go. Look at this. And when we, when we look at the harvest right here, look at all the different points that these dupes can harvest. Yo, slow this down, dupes. All the dupes are getting in on the action. Boom. Okay, so that was a chunk of lumber right there. 300 kilograms for one branch. Oh, we're now up to 600. Bam. 900. Looks like it's going to be one... So it looks like it's going to be 1.8... Uh, tons of lumber right there. So if we just kind of stack all of that up on top of each other. Yes, 1,800 kilograms of lumber. So in the wood burner, that wouldn't be a huge amount of power. However, if you were to refine that into ethanol, I think it might be quite a bit more useful. Not only that, that generates polluted dirt. Mmm. So that consumes water but generates polluted dirt. Polluted dirt is then reprocessed, plus you run it to the petroleum generator, which gives off polluted water. Hmm, interesting. We'll have to cover that in another video. Now, another way to process polluted dirt is to feed it to a pokey shell. Now, the pokey shell, stop beating up meat, actually consumes polluted dirt and excretes sand. However, you can notice that one of its crazy traits uh, is that when it lays an egg, it goes into protecting mode right there and will actually attack anything that gets close to it. So you might want to be careful when you go to interact with a pokey shell. One of the other things that it does is that it actually molts over time in that it will give off its shell and that shell can be reprocessed here into lime. It'll also give off its shell if you attack it and kill it because it keeps beating up your dupes. Nobody attacks Meep and gets away with it. Get him, Meep. Bam. Wrecked. So we can see right here, pokey shell, molt to lime. That's pretty cool. Why is that? Why is it listed twice? Clay, you put it here twice, but you forgot to put anything here. And last but not least, we have pips. And pips are available in the forest biome right here. These little guys are slightly adorable, but incredibly annoying. You might be wondering why are they incredibly annoying? Well, they can pretty much climb on anything, including <laughs> ceilings. So yes, they are just as mobile as the Drekos, and as you can see right here, they like to knock things out of storage bins. These pesky little critters. Jeez, what are we ever going to do with these? I wonder how much food you get out of them. Hmm. 1,600 calories. So yes, they are absolutely adorable. <laughs> and uh, as you can see here, the pokey shell is protecting uh, something that is very special to them. So there's actually an egg over here. So if you were to move this egg out, you can see that it goes from being super aggressive to <gasps> I'm innocent, don't attack me. And now it's eating poop. But oh, it's getting attacked by a pipsqueak. This is a critter battle royale. What's up? Oh, wait, that wasn't eating poop. That was actually attacking the pip. That's kind of dark. And getting back to the whole cycle of dirt right here, pips will consume trees and then extrete dirt at 75% the capacity right there. So see that little guy took a big bite out of that tree and eventually they're going to poop out some dirt. What? What are you doing? What are you doing? Just messing up my storage bins. Ah! All right, Pip, what does your drowning animation look like? Well, let's try again. Hmm? That's underwhelming. <laughs> you just climb on out of there. All right. Have fun. Oh, no! A pokey shell spawn. Look at how adorable it is until it gets pissed off and tries to destroy you. <laughs> well, there you have it. An intro to the launch upgrade. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this episode here of Oxygen Not Included. If this looks like the channel for you, maybe consider hitting that subscribe button. As always, stay awesome, guys. Peace. Brathgar out. Mm. Oh, that was a little too much. It's uh, getting kind of misty up in here.